yeah, thank thank you all for coming out to the you know the last talk of the day. I really appreciate your attention, especially for this uh, deep dive topic. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about how the Beam Data Frame API scales up uh, pandas so that you can do your pandas data analytics um, on distributed data sets. Um, yeah, and these slides are available. There's a online. There's a link there, so you can follow along. There's links throughout the slides you might want to take a look at. Um, yeah, so as Austin said, I'm, I'm Brian Hewlett. I'm a software engineer at Google. I work on the team that uh, contributes to Apache Beam. So I have become a, an Apache Beam committer. Uh, prior to that, I was a, uh, I worked on Apache Arrow. I actually contributed the initial JavaScript implementation of Apache Arrow. Um, so I am also a, an Arrow committer. And I'm really interested in finding ways to, to use those two things together. Um, Got lots of contact info here. The um, you'll see the one thing that's out of place is my GitHub is the neural bit. The neural bit is an anagram of Brian Hewlett. So hopefully that makes that make a little bit more sense um, when you see me commenting on your PRs. I want to throw in a little bit of a little slide about me personally because I'm not just a robot that writes code and, and reviews PRs. I am I'm a human. I'm a person. So I live in Seattle with my wife. Um, we're also, we're both runners. We like to do outdoorsy things, we like to do weird things like this. And what I'm showing in the picture here, where we went on a run in Seattle, where we cross every bridge that goes north south across the canals there, except for I 5, because you can't, as a pedestrian, go on the, on the interstate. But um, we went on every bridge, including you know, all the drawbridges and the locks. So um, that was a fun adventure. I also went on an adventure this morning where I went for a run down in downtown Austin and got a little bit lost and ended up having to run an extra mile. So, All right, but yeah, enough about me. Let's jump into data frame. So the agenda for the talk, I'm first gonna talk about, just introduce what is pandas. So don't worry if you don't know what pandas is. Um, I'll, I'll give a, a brief introduction into that. Uh, and then also explain why we thought it was worthwhile to put, the, put a pandas API into Beam. Um, then we're going to go, I'll give you a quick tour of how the data frame API works, how that interacts with uh, the rest of Beam. Um, and then, uh, then we'll do a deep dive into how the data frame API actually works, how we're able to take your data frame logic and scale it up um, for running on a distributed runner. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, the data frame API has been, has exited experimental, it was about a year ago when it happened. So it's been available for a while now, so we've gotten a little bit of uh, usage and some feedback. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some lessons learned and based on that, some, some future work that we'd like to do. So yeah, first off, what is Pandas? Uh, so Pandas is a Python data analytics library for doing analytics on tabular data sets. Um, it's, it's really commonly used in these inter interactive use cases. So it's used either you know, in a, in a Python uh, notebook environment, which I'll show, or, you know, even just at a, at a Python REPL like this. Um, so in this example, I'm showing, you know, you can create this simple data frame object. Um, and then when you, you know, when you print it out, it shows you the, a nice view of your full data set. Um, you know, in, and here I just made a little toy data frame with some random data, but you, you know, in practice, you would actually be, you know, reading data from a file um, that you want to actually do some analytics on or, you know, reading it in from some other source. Um, once you have one of these data frame objects, you can do all kinds of operations on it. So I'm showing a, a few of those here. So this is, you know, we, we printed out our data frame and then do, you can do a grouped aggregation on it. Uh, you can also access individual columns. So we can say in this data frame, we have, you know, column A, B, C, D, I access the column just individual column C, um, and or then we can do operations on the individual column as well. You can take like a global aggregation of that, get the mean of that of that data set. Um, just a terminology note: so the the uh, overarching data structure is a data frame, and so that's what the table is called. But then in an the, in individual thing, which which I was just calling a column, is actually called a series in uh, pandas. So a, a data frame is a collection of named series that all have a, a separate type. 
Um, and here I'm just showing it, yeah, an example of you know other types of analytics that you can do with Python, so in the or with um, with pandas. So in the first case, there we're showing you know doing a, a simple filtering operation where we're filtering based on values in the B column. Um, another form of doing a group aggregation, creating a new column um, based on a computation, etc. Pandas is also used a lot, as I alluded to before, is used in interactively in the interactive context a lot. So that's why I kind of showed it in a REPL there. So, you know, we, it gets used in, in notebooks. So here I have a, a couple screenshots from a notebook where, you know, that's, I think it's linked from the Pandas documentation. They're kind of showing how you can analyze one of these, a publicly available data set using Pandas. Um, and what's nice is these notebook environments often have like tight integrations with pandas. So if you, you know, if you print out a data frame object, it, it drops it into this nice like table view that you can browse around and see your data set. Um, so it's a little bit better than just that, that text view that you get in the Python REPL. Um, and then also data, pandas has uh, plotting tools and things like that that will interact, um, that integrate nicely with the notebook environment. Okay, so why do we want to make a pandas compatible API in Beam? Uh, so there's three different reasons for that that, I, that I'll get into. These are in roughly priority order. So the first is that pandas has a really nice efficient implementation. So I have this uh, picture that I put in all of my slides about a, a, you know, pandas uses a, or in all of my talks. Um, pandas has a, a columnar memory layout. So each series is, is stored as an array. Um, and all of the actual business logic is implemented in C. You know, Python gets a bad rap for not being very performant, but in pandas, everything is like all of the actual number crunching is done with C extensions and it's compiled. Um, and pandas is, is really good at what it does. It's really good at doing in memory, single threaded processing. Um, and the reason that's relevant for us is the way that we have designed the data frame API in Beam is that we actually reuse pandas on individual workers. So we, you know, we uh, use the actual pandas implementation to compute partial results on each of your workers so that um, we're able to take advantage of that very efficient vectorized implementation. Uh, the next reason is that Pandas has a really nice declarative and concise API. So it's an API that's that's worth trying to uh, worth trying to emulate. So you know, here I have an example of showing you know how you would do a, a basic analytic where you know we're reading some CSV data and then doing a group aggregation and writing the output. And it you know it's it's really nice and concise in the Pandas API. Um, it's pretty easy to inspect and understand what it's doing. But to write the same logic in the Beam Python API. Um, you know, requires a lot more boilerplate and it takes a lot more time to sort of get your head around what's, what's going on there. Um, and so, and, and it's less, less declarative, like the, the Python API or the Pandas API is much higher level. Um, and so the last reason and is that Pandas is a very familiar API. It's, it's an API that a lot of our potential user base uh, in the Python community is already very, very familiar with, um, probably for the previous two reasons that it's, you know, it's very efficient and it has this nice API. Um, so I, I, I ran some analytics on this actually. There's a public data set on BigQuery of, that's basically just like a copy of GitHub. Uh, and so looking among about 27 million open source licensed Python files, I counted up how many are importing Beam versus how many are importing Pandas we can see there's actually like 170,000 of them are importing pandas versus only 14,000 beam. Oh, I just got my step goal um, swinging my arms around. <laughs> uh, and so let's, yeah, about 12 times as many people are, are Python files are using pandas as beam. And this gets even more stark if we look at notebook files, these IPy notebook files, um, that there it's 173 times. Um, and what's interesting is, is pandas actually is like, 21% of the corpus, so like a fifth of all notebook files on GitHub are, are using pandas. So um, the takeaway, of course, is that you know pandas is very familiar to these to Python to the Python open source community. Um, there's tons of examples out there that you can look at, even if you're not working in open source code. You know, you're working in an enterprise. There's a lot of things that you'll a lot of things you'll be able to draw from to figure out how to do what you want to do.
So, but you know, so pandas is really great, but it, of course, it has this limitation that it is like can only process an in-memory data set, and it's only single-threaded. It can't be distributed in any way. So, our our potential users are left with this um, difficult choice between Apache Beam, which has it can scale. It's going to be able to scale up for them to process distributed data sets, but it's got an unfamiliar API. Or they can choose to use pandas, but you know, it's going to be limited to processing in-memory data sets on a single node. So of course, we want to fill that gap with the Beam Data Frame API. So the yeah, so next we'll jump into what the Beam Data Frame API looks like from the user perspective really quickly. Uh, so at its core for the Data Frame API, what we have is a Data Frame Transform. So Data Frame Transform is just a P transform. But it just happens to be a very, very complicated one. Um, so it, it, data frame transform, I think of it, it, it's very similar to SQL transform if you're familiar with that. So it, it takes an input P collection that has a schema associated with it. And the, you apply that to a P transform that takes a single argument that describes some potentially very complicated pipeline logic. Um, in SQL transform, the, the single argument is like a SQL query. In, in data frame transform, it's a function that takes an input deferred data frame object and does some uh, computation on it that describes you know, what you want to do with your data frame logic. And then when you apply that P transform, we produce an output P collection that has a schema associated with it that represents the, the output of that result or the output of that uh, computation. Um, you can also use data frame transform with multiple outputs. So you can apply, you can pass in a tuple of P collections or a dictionary of P collections, and those get passed in as arguments to your um, to the to the function in the that you uh, pass the data frame transform. Uh, or if you don't want to interact with it that way, if you don't want to use the P transform method, you can actually just operate on these deferred data frame objects directly. So you can convert between a P collection and to and a uh, deferred data frame. So you can call to data frame on a schema aware P collection and get a deferred data frame out and then do some analytics on it and then convert back to a P collection and get a schema aware P collection out. Um, so then using that way, you can kind of go back and forth between the P collection and data frame API context if, if that's a, a more ergonomic way for you to use the API. The final thing we have in the Beam Data Frame API are Pandas IOs. So we actually have um, IOs. So Pandas, as I was showing before, you know, has IOs built into it. So you can read, you can call read CSV or read Parquet, and it reads your file and brings all the data in memory that then you can um, use all of these data frame operations on. Uh, we have analogs for all of those in the Beam Data Frame API as well. Uh, but instead of reading, you know, a file from your local disk, we will actually, you know, we want you to be reading files from distributed storage, uh, cloud storage like GCS or S3. Um, and so you can you can call, say, read Parquet and read a bunch of files from some bucket and uh, use that to create a Beam deferred data frame object, which then you can do analytics on. And again, use on the output side, you can use the conventional pandas to CSV or to Parquet or whatever output file you want to write to and write output data to uh, cloud storage. So under the hood, this actually uses file IO. So you know, that, that's what gives us the ability to read from cloud storage. And it does the you know, distributed reading and also liquid sharding support. Um, and then in combination, it actually uses the actual pandas read CSV implementation, so, which is actually very good. Like a lot of development work has gone into sort of optimizing just CSV reading. Um, in pandas, so um, yeah. So that is it for the tour at the user level. I, I'm gonna, I'll stop in case there are any questions before we get into like the the meat of it with the deep dive. Yeah, Ahmed. Yeah, so there, there are completely, the question was how do we keep up with all the IOs that Beam has um, if we have separate IOs? And yeah, the answer is that we don't. Um, there, it's just, yeah, they're totally separate IOs um, in the, the Pandas API. Um, I think there, there are some situations where 
So like we have a Parquet IO and we also have read Parquet in Pandas, but there isn't really like a CSV IO. So I think right now actually read CSV is what we recommend as the, the best way to sort of read CSV data from cloud storage um, because it actually, um, it, it will infer a schema unlike um, any other way that you would be reading CSV data. So yeah, that's actually something that I should mention is that um, when you use these pandas IOs, we actually take a peek at the start of your data. So when you read CSV data, we look at like the first hundred rows and then use that to infer what is the schema of your data. So we're able to know like what is the shape of that deferred data frame um, before you start doing analytics on it. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> uh, for now. Yeah, I, so we don't have good benchmarks for that. I ran one where I just did some analytics and it was uh, you know, twice as fast on some just sort of random analytics that I was doing. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we don't have really great benchmarks comparing it. Can you go? Um, To ensure the video um, oh, gets yeah. this, the can, you, was, can you at least repeat the questions? Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, um, the question was, what is the cost of converting back and forth between um, data frames and key collections? And yeah, so we have to do, you know, we have to take those, uh, take your input data and batch it up to create an individual pandas data frame. So there is some, some work involved there. Um, that's something that, you know, actually we, I, so I, the answer is I don't actually know. It, it, it's kind of hard to quantify, like depends on how much you're doing outside of data frames, how much you're doing in data frames. Um, but the, with, that's something that we're trying to eliminate is that work of having to batch up your data set to create a pandas data frame. Um, in my, the talk I gave earlier with Andrew where I was talking about batch do funds, that's um, something that we'd really um, like to uh, that's something that will enable eliminating that batching work that we have to do. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to move on though, because I want to get through the, the deep dive part. Um, okay. So before I get into how the data frame API works, I want to clarify something about how pandas works, um, which is all pandas objects have an index associated with them. Uh, this is something that I didn't really realize when I was first just sort of using pandas as a user. Um, you know, you see when you print out the data frame, you see like all of your actual columns, the A, B, C, D, and then there's this like one up counter on the side that, you know, it's just sort of like, what's that? Um, but that's actually, you know, a critical feature of every, of every pandas object data frame and series. Um, and so every, even if you, um, if you, you know, when you read your CSV data, that all gets brought in as the actual series. And then there's also this uh, index object that just gets generated whether, whether you need it or not. So it's always gonna be there. Um, so in, some, in a lot of cases, it's just, a, the index object just doesn't have any meaning. It's just a one-up counter that gets added. Um, but in other cases, like if you do at the output of this grouped aggregation, where you do a group by and then a sum, uh, in that case, the A column there is actually the index of that data frame. So there are other cases where the index does have meaning. Uh, and yeah, so all of these objects have indexes. The, the other thing that's important to realize is that most, um, most operations in pandas use the index implicitly. So in this example, that is probably a little bit difficult to make sense of very quickly. But what, I, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that, you know, if you do some arithmetic to, uh, between two series, you know, even though it looks like, you know, if you're taking like A times B, that it's just going to like zip them up in order and, and do the multiplication for each element in order. It's actually, um, it's actually doing an implicit join on the index. So if you, if you modify the index of one of the series that you're doing, that you're multiplying, um, things get reordered and we, uh, and pandas does a, a different calculation. So this is actually like a really, um, a, an important feature that we're able to take advantage of in order to distribute it um, because we're able to partition based on that index in order to basically perform their computations. 
Whereas if the, sorry, if the data set were, if this computation were actually just based on the order of the data, then that would be much more challenging for us to distribute because doing things in order is, is challenging. Okay, so how do we actually, how does the, the data frame API work? Um, what's, what's actually going on under the hood when you have this data frame transform? Um, so our objective here is, you know, we have this data frame transform and we have the user has provided some function. Our objective is we need to make a beam pipeline graph out of that. So, you know, we need some pardus and, and group by keys. Um, so how, how do we get there? So what happens is first data frame transform calls your function. So we create, instead of passing in a pandas data frame object that actually, you know, has all of your data in memory, we have an Apache Beam deferred data frame object uh, that we pass in to your function. And then as you do, and the deferred data frame object has all of the uh, equivalent operations on it that we have in pandas. And as we run through your logic, rather than eagerly performing the computation as pandas does, we build up an expression tree that represents what the computation was trying to do. You know, so in this case, at the root of the tree, we have a placeholder representing the actual input to the function. And then there's nodes for uh, getting column A and getting column B and then multiplying B and then adding the two together. So there's a, a node in this tree that represents you know, all, of the, all of the computation, uh, each individual step of the computation that you're trying to do. Um, What's important to note is that this is not a beam pipeline graph yet. We're not, we're not done. This is a, a different graph. Um, we have a separate graph structure that we keep track of just within the data frame API that we then have to optimize and turn into a beam pipeline graph. So our goal here, so what we wanna do with this expression tree is we, um, we're gonna turn it into a beam pipeline graph that looks like this. So we're gonna take some pieces of that expression tree and those pieces, individual pieces are gonna become do funds that will execute as par dues. And then in between there, we're gonna do group by keys. So the, uh, the problem we need to solve is identify the places, where do we need to do a group by key? Um, so you can imagine, you know, if you're, if you're in your pandas logic, you have something like a join or you're doing a group aggregation, like that's a case where you need to do a group by key in order to co-locate the data um, to do your aggregation or, or your join. So um, to figure out, to understand how we get there, I wanna dive into what, uh, what is the actual metadata that we have on, these, on this expression tree. So looking at, for example, the, the add node here, you can see that you know, we have a few pieces of metadata. The first is just a name, every, every node has a name. We also have you know, what you need for the basic graph structure. So we have the uh, references to the nodes that are inputs to this node. So we have, in this case, we're adding the output from the multiply node and the get column A node. So those are the two inputs to this expression. And then we have an actual Python function. This is the function that we're gonna use at uh, pipeline execution time to actually execute your logic. So that's gonna be a little piece of one of your do funds. Um, and then we have this proxy object. So the, the proxy object, it represents what is the, it's, it's our, our way of representing the type of the output of this expression. So in this case, you know, we're adding two inputs, the multiply and get column A that are both floating point. So the output of that is going to be a, a floating point series. So the way we track that is we actually store this proxy, which is an empty series of the same type. Uh, if the output of this node were a data frame, it would just be an empty data frame that had a bunch of columns with all this, the equivalent types that we expect to see at execution time. Uh, so the, the proxy is important because we use it for, um, for validation and also giving um, authentic error messages to the user. So the, the way that works is actually in, that in order to generate the proxy for this node, we take the proxy for the inputs, so the, the proxy for the multiply, which is just an empty float64 series, and same for get column A, it's an empty float64 series. We take those empty series and we pass them through the function for this expression. So we take those and add them together, 
and the output is our proxy for this function. So you know, if you add two float64 empty series together in Panda, you still get an empty float64 series out, and that becomes our proxy. Um, so this is, you know, in that case, it, it wouldn't be very hard to figure out what the proxy should be. But this is really helpful in other more complicated cases where um, you know, we're able to just sort of leverage existing logic in pandas to figure out what the proxy is. Uh, and the other thing that's really nice about it is that if something goes wrong there, if you say if you were trying to add two columns that had mismatched types and you know, there are things that you can't add, um, you'll get an error at pipeline construction time when we try to generate that proxy that says, you know, if these two columns have a mismatch type, you'll get, and it'll be the same error that you would get from pandas if you tried to do that uh, eagerly. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the proxy objects, this was actually, this was Robert Bradshaw's idea, it wasn't mine, so I can say this, I think it was a, a very clever solution to this problem. And yeah, oh, sorry, we also use proxies for figuring out the, for tracking the data type of these deferred data frame objects. So that's how, when we need to map back to P collections, then that's how we know what is the, what is the data type of this expression. So, you know, in this case, we would turn this back into a P collection of float 64s, or if it were a data frame, uh, if the proxy were a data frame, we would turn it back into a P collection with a schema that has the same structure as that data frame. Okay, so these last two bits are the pieces that are important for the creating that uh, pipe, beam pipeline graph that I was showing you earlier. Uh, so the first piece is this requires partition by specification. So that indicates uh, the type of partitioning, which uh, is our term that we've defined, that is required for the inputs of this expression. Um, so we, this is basically indicating in order, in order to compute this expression faithfully, I need both of the inputs to be partitioned by index. Um, so there are a few different options we can put there. It's just that in this expression, it's uh, both of these things are, are index partitioning. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into what the different types of partitioning are after this. The other specification we have is preserved partition by, and this is a is just an optimization that allows us to say, if if you give me inputs that are partitioned by index, then I will the output is still going to be partitioned by index, um, and that's an important optimization because it allows us to sort of chain more things together without having to do more group by keys to enforce the partitioning, um, and. Uh, yes, that's all I have to say there. So yeah, so there are three main types of partitioning requirements. The first is index partitioning, um, which was the, the requirement for the last one. So the index partitioning indicates that we are going to, yeah, we need to partition the data set by index um, based on that, you know, the index that everything is implicitly joined by, like I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so we actually do it by a hash of the index itself, modulo n. So we want to break it up into n different partitions. We try to do a little bit of, of smart scaling to figure out what that n should be. But, you know, at its core, you know, we're just doing some hash-based indexing to break up your data set into n partitions and bring everything that has the same index value onto the same node. Then we also have singleton partitioning. So this is one we try to avoid using, but what singleton partitioning does is basically indicates we're just gonna drop everything into a, the same key. So we just have one key, the key is, is none. Um, and all, your entire, when you have a expression that requires singleton partitioning, everything in your data set is gonna get brought into a single node. Um, so this is just, um, unfortunately, you know, some, uh, some of the uh, some of the operations in the pandas API are just things that were designed for an in-memory API. So you know they're things that you just you can't really do in a distributed way. Uh, and so we just had to add this singleton partitioning as sort of a fallback to implement those. Um, there are also some cases where we use the use singleton partitioning internally. If we recognize that, like, so there are cases where we, we have a specialized implementation for an aggregation, like standard deviation, 
where we compute this individual moments on individual workers, and then we use singleton partitioning to bring all of the moments together uh, to do the final aggregation. But you know, we we at that point we know that the data has already been reduced so much be, into computing these moments that it's it's okay to bring it all onto a single worker. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. And the other thing I should say about singleton partitioning is that some are, some operations do require it. Um, and but we will always warn you if you've used an operation that requires singleton partitioning, will raise an error, and you have to kind of opt in to say, I recognize that like this is something that's going to bring all of my data onto a single node, and I'll probably blow up the memory, but um, you know, or but I'm okay with that, uh, or I know that the data has already been you know aggregated a lot at this point. Then the last form of partitioning we have is just arbitrary partitioning. And so that just indicates that you know, what, you're, what you're doing in this expression isn't something that needs to have any sort of special partitioning. So this would be things like you know, if you were like doing a multiply by a constant or um, accessing a column from a data frame. These are things that like, you don't need to have the data co-located in any particular way. Like it could be distributed all over on a bunch of workers and you know, we just do the same thing everywhere. So you know we don't we don't need any parti uh, special partitioning for those uh, for those expressions. So yeah, so stepping all the way back, I guess zooming out and looking at our, our full expression tree. Um, now we need to to use that information to break this up and turn it into a beam pipeline graph. So what we do is we identify, up. so we have a, an optimizer that's kind of looking at all of those partitioning requirements, and I won't get into how, how all of that works, but you know, it looks at all of those partitioning requirements in the graph, and it identifies the places where we're going to need to do group by keys to co-locate data. So in this case, we identify one place here around this group by. So in order to do the group by and the sum, we need to, we need to split it up and co-locate the data there. We break up the break up the expression tree, create a do fund that is going to just push data through that uh, that subgraph of your of your tree, and then insert a group by key that is enforcing that partitioning requirement. Um, so that's the that's the uh, hash based partitioning that uh, for the index partitioning requirement that I was showing you earlier. So. That is, that's the meat of it. And then finally, there's one last step though that data frame transform does, which is at the, on the input and the output side, we have to, we're going from a P collection, a schema aware P collection where each element in the P collection is you know, just a single logical element. And we need to batch that up into data frames uh, because we want to push actual like, you know, batches of your data through this entire graph to get the vectorized uh, benefits from pandas. So we, we first batch up your schema aware data, push that through this whole graph, and then on the output side, we have to unbatch that back up into logical elements um, to convert it back to a P collection of you know, a schema aware P collection. Oh, all right. You made it through the deep dive. Good job, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess. Uh, I was thinking I would pause for questions here, but I think I'll just keep going because the lessons learned are um, are relatively quick. So then we can get to questions after. Um, yeah. So lessons learned and future work. So the the most consistent uh, feature requests that I've actually gotten from you know prospective users of the Data Frame API is for better support, specifically for BigQuery. Um, in that they, you know, they want to process BigQuery data with the Data Frame API, but uh, and they can do that, but it's kind of hard to do. So you have to do some logic like like what I've shown at the top of the at the slide here, where you do a read from BigQuery, and then you have to do something to kind of declare what your schema is. So in this case, I'm doing it in, in this example, which I, I took from one of the example pipelines we have in Beam. It, you know, we do that with Beam.select. Um, you know, ideally, you know, our, our users wouldn't have to do that. They wouldn't have to always declare what the schema is. So, you know, we should really, when you should be able to just call read from BigQuery and we produce a P collection that has the schema uh, attached to it already. And you would be able to plumb that right into the data frame API. 
And um, then, you know, ideally also, we would be able to then build a nice helper function like read GBQ that would just read from BigQuery and create, um, so at, at pipeline construction time, it would get that schema and then it would create a, an equivalent deferred data frame object that, you know, has all of the appropriate columns and data frame types or in, and data types. Um, so for BigQuery, this is something we're actually actively working on now. Um, there's a 20% contributor who, um, Spay Talk, I think he's giving a talk tomorrow, who's, who's working on this. And there's a, an issue that you can follow if you're interested in it. Um, and, but, you know, this is something that we really need to improve. We need to do this for, other, for more sources to kind of make this API much more accessible. Because it is, it is very painful to sort of ask users to do all of this, uh, to do all of this schema definition stuff. Um, another lesson learned is that compliance is really, really important. I guess that's not, that's not really a lesson. We knew that before, um, but something we, we didn't realize is that we, we, we cut out a few, um, features from our, from our implementation of the data frame API because we, you know, they were things that aren't really compatible with our model. And so, you know, some operations in pandas are actually sensitive to the order of the data, for example. Um, and there are other operations that, you know, don't really make sense for Apache Beam, like plotting operations. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of, I, as we were going through all of the pandas operations and trying to implement everything, we just identified a few classes of things that were things like, oh, well, we'll we can't really do that. That doesn't really map to our model. So, like, we'll, we'll punt on that. Um, but then it turned out that that, you know, that ended up being a pretty significant portion of the, the Pandas API. So, you know, for there actually are about like 14% of the Pandas API are these operations that are in some way sensitive to the order of the data. Um, and so that's something that, that's challenging for us to distribute. Um, and yeah, so, so our overall compliance right now, um, you know, after we kind of had these carve outs is somewhere, depending on how you measure it, it's like, you know, 60 to 70% of the pandas API of, you know, of the pandas operations are operations that we support. Um, and so, you know, that's really not, not good enough. If you want to tell people like, oh, here is a pandas compatible API, then they're going to try to take their existing pandas logic and run it with your, your data frame API. And you know, if you only have 60 to 70 percent of the operations implemented, it's pretty high likelihood that they're going to run into something that doesn't work. And you know, even if you have some alternatives, it's like it's just not a great experience for them to kind of have to keep like running into some issue and then finding the appropriate alternative and keep doing that. So you know, we really need to have better compliance uh, with pandas. So I've attached some some design docs here that I worked on with Andy Yi um, that. Uh, we've we've written that are talking about ways that we can address um, these interactive operations as well as order sensitive operations um, with a few caveats. But, so that's something that you know hopefully we can start to work on uh, in the near future. Uh, another thing that is another lesson learned is that distributed data frames on their own aren't that special anymore. There, I think you know when we started making the data frame API, I think Dask data frames existed. But there weren't really that many other. I, I don't know that there were other, any other sort of distributed data frame alternatives. Uh, but now, you know, Spark has Koalas that's now you know built into mainline Spark. Um, there's Modin. There's all kinds of other alternatives for doing this distributed data frame logic. So it's it's not that much of a differentiator for Beam anymore to have it. Uh, and so, but one thing where Beam can differentiate, I think, is by enabling this sort of streaming use case. Um, and so, you know, we could add potentially like streaming sources where we read directly from Kafka and Pub or PubSub and get the schema of your data from, you know, Confluent Schema Registry or the PubSub Schema Service and, you know, bring that into a Beam data frame that then you could actually be able to apply windowing operations on, like apply a rolling window um, and then, you know, write the result out with an existing uh, Pandas sync. So these are things that, so that specifically the, the read Kafka and the rolling are things that, you know, don't exist in the data frame API now. Um, but I think, you know, there are things that we need to, that we should consider adding to, to make uh, the data frame API better. And if this is something you're interested in, like, please, please follow along in that issue um, and, you know, comment on it, let us know. So, yeah, so finally, call to action, how, how you can help. 
Uh, I, it, it would be really beneficial if you do, you know, if you did try your use case in the data frame API. And you know, if it doesn't work, like let us know. Uh, we'd really like to know like where where did it go wrong? Uh, file an issue and so that we can try to address it. And then another thing is, you know, that is pretty low effort would be to just contribute some tests. You know, if there's some operation that you care about that has some esoteric use case, um, you know, we have uh, this big suite of tests, this Apache Beam .data frame frames test that just runs a ton of tests that look like this. So it looks like, you know, we, you, we have self.run test and you pass in a Lambda that does some data frame logic. And then what we do is we run it with pandas and then we run it again with the Beam data frame API, sort of emulating a distributed environment and we make sure that we get the same result. So, you know, if there's like some little esoteric piece of pandas logic that, that you think is valuable, um, you know, please add a test that does that. And, you know, if it doesn't work, we would really love to know about it. But even if it does work, you know, we'd love to have that test in Beam to make sure it continues to work. And you know the other things you can do uh, are well, a little bit higher effort, but it would really be really great if you could add schema support to <laughs> to more I/O. So you know infer schemas from from data sources, um, and then also you know get involved with the uh, the work on adding interactive and order sensitive operations that we've um, that we have the design docs for that I showed earlier. So those are links to the issues. You know if you want to get involved there. So. All right, that is all I had. So are there any questions?